And so we'll spend the next few minutes talking about some of the more practical considerations of epigenomics data analysis. And so here's an example of uh, ChIP-seq data for a human cell line uh, around one particular locus, uh, the E2F2 transcription factor. And so here you can uh, basically just see different histone modifications, uh, K4ME1, K4 trimethylation, and so on and so on. And you basically see a map of uh, where all the reads have been aligned to this locus. Uh, and so something to keep in mind is that uh, currently most of the, the vast majority of chip seq data available out there uh, is generally done using short read sequencing. And so most of the sequence tags again are somewhere on the order of like 30 to 50 base pairs. Um, and the, you know, the number of reads uh, you observe in any given data set depends on what the depth was. But generally speaking for chip seq, uh, people have concluded that you need somewhere around at least 10 million uh, map reads in order to get good signal on your chip seq data. Uh, analysis and so uh, oftentimes you'll see somewhere around 10 million map reads on any given data set. And so of course as we talked about before um, you can't just look at uh, chip seq reads uh, mapped to the genome because you have to take into account uh, background bias in terms of bias towards chip seq reads falling in certain regions of the genome versus others. And so typically when you call chip seq peaks um, you have to look at uh, some control experiment, which gives you some indication as to uh, where do reads tend to fall in the genome if you didn't have any antibody for your, for example. And so when you typically do a chip seek uh, analysis of epigenetic marks, you typically have to uh, take a number of steps related to quality control uh, to make sure that your data is good. And so one of the most important quality control steps is that you need to basically generate a controlled data set of reads to get mapped to the genome to tell you about uh, sequencing bias in your experiment. And so again, the main problem here is that, um, you know, even when you, even uh, ignoring antibody bias, uh, reads in general uh, don't come uniformly from across the entire genome uh, because there's biases in sequencing. And so, for example, uh, one of the steps of uh, ChIP-seq is to fragment the genome. And so fragmentation doesn't happen equally likely across the genome. Uh, open regions tend to be more easy to fragment than closed regions. Um, and furthermore, uh, in terms of mapping reads to the genome, uh, like we talked about in the assembly lecture, repetitive sequences uh, tend not to get assembled very well. And so they tend to get over collapsed in the sense that we tend to under basically underestimate how long repetitive sequences are. And so uh, what that means is that more, uh, sometimes there may be a bias towards um, peaks in repetitive sequences just because there's many potential regions in the genome that uh, have repetitive sequences, but they get kind of collapsed into the same region in an assembly. Um, and so the main way to control for uh, biases in ChIP-seq experiments is to basically just take some of your uh, DNA input and uh, basically run a chip seq assay without the antibody or using a, a non-specific antibody and then do the same fragmentation uh, sequencing and then mapping the reads to the genome to tell you about um, you know which parts of the input DNA tend to get mapped uh, more frequently than you'd expect by chance. So a useful QC metric for chip seq assays is to calculate uh, the fraction of short reads that you were able to uniquely map to the genome. And this fraction should be hopefully more than 50%. And so the idea here is that um, when you perform a chip seq assay and you sequence your reads and then try to align these reads to the genome to figure out where they came from, one of a few things can happen. So first of all, you can, if you're lucky, you can get what's known as a uniquely mapped read. And so what these what this means is that these are reads that when you align them to the genome, there's only one location on the genome that gives you an exact match. And so you more or less know where that read came from. And then you have no further problems. The second scenario is uh, also pretty common where you have a read that maps to multiple locations on the genome uh, with the same quality. So say, for example, they, they map exactly to more than one region in the genome with no errors. And so there you have a problem in the sense that uh, you know, you, you have to decide, you know, you can decide to do one of a few things. 
Uh, if you want to be conservative, you can say, well, I don't know where this read came from, so I'm just going to toss it. Um, and that would be conservative. Uh, the problem with that approach and the reason why people typically don't do that is because there's so many multi-mapping reads on any given chip seek assay that if you were to toss all of the multi-mapping reads, you would basically have effectively very low sequencing depth and you wouldn't be able to call peaks very well. The more common approach is uh, what's known as the probabilistic approach. And so here the idea, the general idea is that you as assign a fraction of your read to all the locations that it maps to. And so one naive way to do this, for example, is that suppose you have a read, it maps to two different locations on the genome. You could naively just say, okay, well, uh, if that read is equally likely to come from either location, then I'm just going to conceptually split this read in half. And I'm just going to claim that half of a read mapped to one location and half of a read mapped to the other location. And so this is slightly smarter than the uh, approach of just throwing it away. Uh, what's actually even more common is to uh, fractionally assign reads based on uniquely mapping reads. And so suppose that you first initially map all your uniquely mapping reads to the genome and you know where they land. Now suppose you have one read that multi-maps to two locations, location A and location B. And suppose location A has two uniquely mapping reads mapped to it, and location B has only one uniquely mapping read to it. So it turns out that the even more correct thing to do would be to say, okay, well, since location A has twice as many uniquely mapping reads mapping to it as opposed to location B, then what I'll do is I'll take this multi-mapping read and I'm going to fractionally assign it to the two locations. But this time I'll fractionally assign two thirds of it to the location that has two uniquely mapping reads and I'll only assign one third to the location B where only one uniquely mapping read mapped to it. And it turns out that that usually gives a better estimate of the real uh, of the real probability that your multi-mapping read came from those two locations than just dividing it equally. Um, another potential problem is you might end up with reads that actually just don't map anywhere uh, to your reference genome. And so this can happen, for example, because um, you might have regions that uh, just were not able to be assembled. And so if you have a region that wasn't able to be assembled, but a chip seek read came from that region, then you wouldn't be able to map to it. Um, another potentially, another related problem is one of um, uh, promiscuous reads. And so the idea here is that there are certain read regions of the human genome, for example, where basically every chip seek assay seems to pull down reads that map to those regions. So it doesn't matter what you're chip seeking. Certain regions of the genome seem to always have reads aligned to them for whatever reason. And so it's pretty typical for uh, chip seek peak colors to maintain or allow you to input what's called a blacklisted region. And so what those blacklisted regions are, are those are regions where they're kind of known that lots of reads map there for whatever reason that are not biological. And so those regions are automatically excluded um, from the final alignment. Um, similarly, there are what's called whitelisted regions, which are regions where, for example, that have very unique sequence, and you know that any read that maps to those regions are probably real, and so those reads are always kept. And some other measure of quality control uh, typically used for ChIP-seq libraries is what's called library complexity, or uh, what's also known as the non-redundant fraction of reads. And so the general idea here is that for most genomes that are huge, um, which are most genomes that you'd be dealing with, um, you wouldn't really expect uh, your exp any given ChIP-seq experiment to yield two fragments that are exactly the same size and generate therefore exactly the same reads. Um, just because, you know, genomes large, most things you're chip seeking tend to map to many locations. And so the chances of getting two reads from the exact same location in the same experiment is very low. And so basically the idea is that, um, if you look at your reads from a chip seek experiment and you see a lot of duplicates, 
then those duplicates are more likely, much more likely to be f as a result of PCR duplication than um, those being like bona fide reads that just happen to be from the same, from fragments of the same size. And so uh, if, you know, you have a lot of duplicated reads uh, due to PCR duplication, then the, the typical uh, reason for this is because you, for example, didn't have enough input DNA into your chipsy chip protocol in the first place. And so basically you just had a few regions of the uh, genome pulled down by your chipsy assay. And so you're, you know, when you're, when you're duplicating, uh, when you're duplicating your reads, basically you just, you're just amplifying the same few reads uh, that you pulled down in the first place. And so your, your library is said to be low complexity and therefore it doesn't it's not representative of uh of the binding of or yeah of the binding of the transcription factor you're looking at or it's not representative of all the locations where your histone modifications were uh, in the first place and so the way that you typically assess um library complexity is first you would draw like a histogram like i'm showing you here on the top right hand of the slide where you basically count for every read in the genome or every read that you sequenced, uh, how many copies of it exactly did you see in your data set? And so typically you'd have a plot like this where uh, most uh, reads are only present in exactly one copy. So that's represented by M1. And then a minor set of reads are represented by, say for example, two copies, and that would be uh, that would give you M2 and so on and so on. And so intuitively, the ratio of M1 to M2 should be relatively large, which indicates that most reads are uniquely uh, mapping and there's only one copy of it. Uh, formally, you can calculate a statistic called the non-redundant fraction. And this basically just comes out to be the number of uh, exact locations in the genome where your uniquely mapping reads map to, divided by the number of reads that map to exactly one location. And so when every read is uh, mapping to its own unique location, then your non-redundant fraction is one. And it's smaller the more uh, duplications you have. And so generally speaking, your NRF ratio should be approximately 0 0.8 um, when you're dealing with somewhere between 10 and 80 million reads. So the next QC metric is called strand cross-correlation analysis. And this QC metric comes from the idea that when you perform a chip seek assay and you do the cross-linking and fragmentation step, because your chip seek assay collects genomic material from across many cells, uh, within any given cell, although the cross-linked piece of DNA will pretty much is pretty much guaranteed to contain the TF binding site of interest, uh, the exact fragment ends is going to be a little bit different uh, from cell to cell. And so what happens is that if you do, for example, paired-end sequencing, uh, both your forward and reverse uh, reads will align on either side of the TF binding site, but again, across many different cells, where exactly those forward and reverse reads align to the genome is going to be a little bit different in each case. And so what happens is that when you perform your chip assay and then you uh, sequence your forward and reverse reads, and you align those forward and reverse reads to the genome, you're going to notice that uh, there's going to be like a distribution of positions where the forward, forward reads align to, and the distribution of positions where the reverse reads align to. And so that's represented by the red and the blue curves. And what you'll generally find is that the peaks of those two distributions will be separated by some distance d base pairs, and D will approximately correspond to the average length of the fragment uh, of the TFDNA fragment. And so if you take each of the red and the blue curves and you shift them by some distance D over two uh, towards each other, uh, basically that new peak represented by the green curve will approximately represent where the real binding site is uh, on the genome. And so in a strand cross-correlation analysis, the idea is that you have these two piles of reads corresponding to the 5' prime and 3' prime end uh, of your fragment surrounding your, for example, binding site or histone modification uh, location. 
and these reads are piling on the uh, on the opposite strands uh, of your genome. And so the idea is that if you look at the correlation between the heights of the uh, of the distributions of the peaks uh, between the ble- and between the blue and the red curve, as you kind of start shifting them towards each other, basically you can plot uh, that correlation as a function of how far you shift the blue and the red curves. And so that's basically the graph you see in the top right hand corner. And basically you can see as you start shifting it, shifting it, you'll get to the point where represented by uh, point C, uh, or what's also represented visually by part C of the diagram. And basically the correlation should be peaked whenever those two uh, distributions, the blue and the red one, overlap each other the most. Um, and so again, uh, however far you had to shift, for example, the blue curve and the red curve towards each other to uh, to get that maximal correlation, when you multiply it by two, then you basically get the average fragment length uh, of the fragment that surrounds, for example, your binding site. Um, and so the point here is that this strand cross correlation analysis is a measure of quality control because when you have uh, high quality data, so high quality resolution and good fragmentation and so on, that cross correlation, that point C should get fairly high correlation. Uh, and when your data is, uh, is bad, then that cross correlation will be very low. And so here's an example of the uh, of a normalized strand cross correlation values uh, that this roadmap epigenomics project I spoke about earlier uh, basically published on their set of 113 uh, human cell lines and primary cells. And so here, basically, each uh, each column here corresponds to a different cell type or cell context. And we're only I'm only showing a subset of the 113. And basically, in the heat map on the bottom uh, are basically the uh, strand cross correlation scores for different histone modifications. And basically, the point you can see here is that um, there's a pretty big variety uh, variation in terms of the strand cross correlation across different samples. And you can broadly see, for example, for brain cell types, uh, the quality uh, of these data sets as, as estimated by the strand cross correlation, is generally much lower than, for example, uh, cancer cell lines uh, represented by ENCO 2012 uh, in black. Um, and that's just because the brain cell types are from primary brain uh, cells. And so it's harder to get uh, high quality uh, live brain cells compared to, for example, just um, cancer cell lines that you can propagate uh, indefinitely.